Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Wednesday seminar this week. It's great to see such a, a good turnout here in the auditorium, and I'm sure we've got plenty more online as well. Uh, my name is James Johnson. For those who don't know me, I'm the CEO of Geoscience Australia, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, be introducing today's seminar. Let me start by making sure that everyone understands that geoscience acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia because we work all across Australia and we acknowledge their continuing connection to land, to waters and community. And we pay our respects to the people and cultures and the elders past and present. And I'd also like to extend the, that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present today. And we especially welcome our guests uh, uh, in the audience from the Ngadabulgan Native Title Aboriginal Corporation who've travelled from Queensland to join us here at Geoscience Australia. Today's seminar is titled The Traditional Perspective versus Western Perspective of Land and Land's Values. And it'll be presented by Lindley Halliday uh, from the Ngadabulgan Native Title Aboriginal Corporation, which is a registered native title body corporate. Different cultural beliefs, values and backgrounds guide how land is perceived. This talk is going to explore the history of land uh, from the perspectives of custodianship and ownership systems. From a traditional perspective, beliefs and values are linked to land. Restoring connection between people and the land and the sustainable and responsible use of land is presented in the context of perspective on land and land's values. Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program is proud to welcome Lindley and thank her for uh, the public contribution to Geoscience Australia's sharing, uh, knowledge sharing initiative. Uh, so just a little bit about our speaker. Lindley is a Gugu Jungan and Malanbara Yidinji woman and an educator, mainly in uh, primary and public schools. She's worked as an associate lecturer and coordinator at the Queensland University of Technology in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander unit. Uh, Lindley provides cultural training to the wider community and to uh, TAFE in Queensland in Cairns um, as teacher deliverer in Certificate 3 and cultural identity in the remote area teacher education program. Lindley's also a member of the board of, director, uh, board of Directors of the Ngunnabulgan Native Title Aboriginal Corporation. So could you please join me in welcoming Lindley to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah, not all Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, James, for that uh, wonderful and lovely introduction. Thank you to the people here of Geoscience for welcoming us and having us down from the very far north Queensland, where it's hot <laughs> and you're sweating. I am so happy to be wearing a jacket because it just feels just wonderful. So, my little mouse. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. Technology people, it's not my forte. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge, I do an acknowledgement to country. We, the Jungan representative of the Jungan people, would like to acknowledge the Gunnawal people and the Nambri people of this land. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I always say to and to the future because uh, who are our children? because they are our children and they will carry on, hopefully, the legacy, a positive legacy that we leave behind when we are no longer on this earth. Keep getting the little red thing. So today's talk is about traditional perspectives versus Western perspectives of land and land values. Thank you to Geoscience, as I said before, for welcoming us and having us here. I'd like to thank Dr. Meredith Orr. There you go. Uh, oops, wrong little button. Miss Tia Penny and Dr. Rod Kennett for welcoming us um, here and who were, I suppose, 
the, the initial instigators that came up and visited us on country, except for you, Rod, you didn't come up properly, proper out to country, but hopefully you'll be able to come up and, and visit country. Um, it's the girls, the, the ladies will tell you that it's, um, it's a beautiful place. It's stunning. So there we have the ladies on country. And that in the background is Nutterbogen. Our representatives from country, from the NNTAC, which stands for the uh, Nullarbogan Native Total Aboriginal Corporation, is Mr. Judah O'Neill, who was our chairperson and director. He, oops, sorry. He is our, um, he's very, just a little bit about him, very passionate man, um, very vocal man, um, concerning social justice with regards to our people and, and people's, Indigenous people all over Australia. And I probably could stretch that to the world as well, because we all have commonalities. Okay. We tend to look at differences, but we all have commonalities. Oops, sorry. I'm, like I said, technology is not my forte. Uh, myself, uh, I think you've heard a spiel about me from Mr. James Johnson here. Thank you for that. Just one little thing I'd like to add in. Sorry, James. Um, I'm a very, very proud um, person who um, is very privileged to have um, be part of two lands, two countries, my mother's side and my father's side. So one is wet tropics, Malambari Yirinji, and one is savannah, Kukajangan. I feel very honoured and privileged to be part of that. I also have two sons, both doctors. One's a GP in the Gold Coast working and the other is a, a dentist working in Queensland Health and he services Yarraba as well as um, Innisfil with our with our Indigenous people. We have Mr Stephen Brumby here as well, he's a director. Very passionate man too, knowledgeable man. His knowledge came from his grandfather as well as his aunts since he was little. His aunts were very important people in his life who passed down stories and knowledge and information about country to him. It's a privilege to have him here too, because um, the stories that he has told us is just amazing. And then we have Mr. Roberts. Sorry, Robert, I can't say your last name. I've been trying and trying. Um, it's Polish and uh, Maki Sikia. Close enough. Thank you, Robert. Here's our project officer. Robert comes to, to us with a wealth of knowledge, especially from the corporate world. Um, so he brings his skills and experiences to us and we're very uh, honoured to have that. Um, he utilises those skills when coming into our organisation and helping us um, assist and create the projects that we have, and he gets us to where we want to go. So um, it's, it's, it's an actual privilege to have you working for us, Robert, and um, thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge with us. So that's that's the team that's here, but. Um, the team, of course, is, is a lot larger than this, but due to unforeseen circumstances, they weren't able to, to join us here today. So content today is, which I gave you, representing the backgrounds of our people. Why is the topic being presented to you? Some definitions, history, particularly the age of discovery, worldviews and perspectives, the land, Australian Aboriginal perspectives, European Western perspectives. Then we're going to look at us, Jungan people, our land, our country. And then lastly, geoscience and working together. Oops, wrong part. Keep got to go back then. I didn't take that one off, sorry, Robert. So why is this topic being presented to you? Instead of asking that question, why is it being presented to you? I'm going to put these questions to you. 
Why did you attend this presentation and what do you hope to gain? Is this or would this information be useful to you? Especially to, the, to you people who are scientists in the areas that you work in and here in geoscience? How can your information be useful to us? And how are you going to use this information that I presented to you in your work area? Just three questions I'd like you to think about. So let's now look at definitions, specifically definition of land. Anyone know what land is? We didn't teach you that at primary school, did we? <laughs> Sorry about that. So from the Cambridge Dictionary, the definition of land is this. Land is a noun. Do we know what a noun is? OK. Person, place or thing? Yes? Right. So now it's a it's dry surface. The surface of the earth that is not covered by water. That is land, according to the Cambridge Dictionary. Ah, oh, I thought I took that off, Robert. I'm so sorry. I really thought I took that off, but it's going to drive me nuts and it's probably going to drive you nuts. But um, I really sincerely apologise for that, but I thought I took it off. From the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, definition of land is the solid part of the surface of the earth. Also, a corresponding part of the celestial body, such as the moon. Did we ever think of that? No, we didn't, did we? The surface of the earth and all its natural resources. Portion of the earth's solid surface distinguishable by boundaries or ownership. Interesting concept that one, isn't it? That land. So now let's focus on the next uh, topic, which is the age of discovery. So the age of discovery is at the time, does anyone know when the period of age of discovery was? Anyone at history? No, you're all scientists. That's right. You're not into the um, left brain, right brain thing. It's about possession of land. The age of discovery was all about the possession of land and the conversion to Christianity. Okay. Who were the powerhouses? What would, what, what would be the power powerhouse there for Christianity? Oh, you've jumped ahead of me there, darling, but you're quite right. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church. But thank you. you that will lead me into my next one. There you go. So who were the powerhouses? Who were the power countries during that period of time? <laughs> exactly. Spain and Portugal were the power, power countries back then. And I just thought I'd throw up some little um, photos, pictures, images of these vessels that sailed, sorry, that sailed the seas during that age of discovery. Imagine sailing in one of these vessels now instead of a P&O cruiser. <laughs> that would be a difference, wouldn't it? But these vessels travelled the world to look at land, to do some conversion into Christianity and to take possession of land. If they were to take possession of the land, what would they want? Resources. The resources, the natural resources from the land, exactly. So now let's have a look at the intent of that doctrine of the age of discovery. So the doctrine of discovery provided a framework for Christian explorers in the name of the sovereign to lay claim to territories uninhabited by Christians. If the land was vacant, if the land was vacant, then they could be de defined as discovered and their sovereignty claimed. Okay. Remember, this is done back in the 14th and 15th century. But sometimes that generational thinking 
goes down the line. Anyone make, make a comment on that? No? Having a little thought? It's okay, it's good. If you want to ask a question or jump in, that's okay, it's fine. How are you going there, James? All good, how are you going? All good? <laughs> okay. So that was the intent for the Age of Discovery. It was about going out and exploring and possessing lands that were vacant. But we all know land was not vacant. Land was inhabited by the indigenous people of that place, of that country. Okay. E.g. the Americas. E.g. Indonesia. Just a neighbourhood neighbour at the top of us. Australia. And to further add on to that, later on came the Dutch, the English and the French, all followed after the, the Portuguese and the Spanish exploration in that age of discovery. I'm going to skip now. I think I've, I've done that with, with that. I don't want to bore you to, that, to death with that one. So the next part I looked at, um, no, it's not going to do that for me. The next part I looked at um, was this was information that came out of Christopher Columbus's um, art, an article by him, and there were five things that were in that article. The first one was the the, uh, the intent of discovery. The, the third one I chose was this one, and it focuses on today, in, in now, in our time. So it's the UN's perspective on the impact of the doctrine of the age of discovery. This was put out in May. There you go, Chris, I've used it. May 2012, how recent is that? This is done in the 21st century. Now, it talks about a permanent forum. This forum was put together by the United Nations and it was a, a group of delegates who, form, uh, who were formed to look at this age of discovery. The permanent forum noted that while such doctrines of domination and conquest, including terra nullius, and the Regalian Doctrine were promoters as authority for land acquisition. They also encouraged despicable assumptions that Indigenous peoples, and this is Indigenous peoples all over the world, were savages, barbarians, inferior and uncivilised. Among other constructs, the colonisers used to uh, subjugate, dominate and exploit the lands, territories, and resources of the native peoples and their lands. I'm not telling you anything new here, am I? No. no. So the Vatican repudiates the doctrine of discovery. Isn't that interesting? The powerful religion, the powerhouse. Oops, don't want that, Chris, sorry. Let's have a look. On March the 30th, 2023, hello. What year are we in? 2023, isn't that interesting? The Catholic Church, by the way to the Vatican press release, officially repudiated the doctrine of discovery. In no uncertain terms, the church's Magisterium upholds the respect due to every human being. The Catholic Church therefore repudiates these concepts that fail to recognise the inherent human rights of Indigenous peoples, including what has become known as the legal and political doctrine of discovery. Because that thought, that concept came from the Vatican the churches. It gave them, it gave them that power to go forth and to possess lands and take natural resources from that, from that land and to convert them into Christians. 
Any questions? No, we're fine. How is that different, say, to the Islamic perspective of their colonisation? The Islamic? I'm sorry, I didn't go into the Islamic one, darling. So, so but I, um, I would probably say, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Anybody can, out there can answer that question? No? Yeah. We don't know, we don't know. Because the history books that we look at focuses mainly on Christianity. We don't look at the, the other aspects, the other religions and how they've used the age of discovery for other lands, conquering and converting. But thank you for that. I'll go away and I'll research that one now. Another perspective, another view for me to look at. And I think for all of us to look at, because remember, we're just looking at, we're looking at perspectives here of traditional and Western <coughs> uses of land and its value. So I'm going to have a look at some quote of history. History is a link of the future. If you know the history, you'll know the future. So what I've just very, very minutely talked to you about, looking at the age of discovery, people, it's, it's minuscule. This whole thing that I'm talking about is a course in itself. You can get a degree on it. You can get a doctorate on it. You can do your masters on it. What I've got to present to you in now 35 minutes is this, really, really. So it's just giving you hopefully a bit of touch, flavour, thought, so that you take it away. Whatever you want to take away, you take it away and you take it further. Whatever you perceive and get from this, you take it away, you find it. You, you then create your own worldview. We all create our own worldview from our perspectives, from what we see, see, hear and feel. The other quote is this. A generation which ignores history has no past and no future. History is important. It brings us to where we are today. It brings each and every one of you here on this earth, on this planet, where you are today. Without that, you wouldn't exist, would you? But you all have history, we all have history. Hey, Ancestry.com, you know, find your history. So now we're gonna look at definitions of the worldview. Worldviews, as I said before, no, I'm skipping, sorry. So the worldview, is again a noun, right, person, place, a thing, a comprehensive conception or apprehension of the world, especially from a specific standpoint. As scientists, you have your own worldview. Yes, we all have our own worldview, but in the job and occupation that you do, you have a worldview about what you do. As a teacher, I have a worldview about how I teach my children, how I teach children. Uncle Judaloo has a worldview for social justice and how he can bring about empowerment to our people. Same as Stephen. Robert's worldview, because of his background, has helped us in many ways in understanding the corporate world and understanding what's out there in the big world, because we don't get exposed to that. We don't see any of that. So his knowledge and experience helps us how to deal with people in the outside world, especially those big business places. World views again. Here's another definition from the uh, Britannica Dictionary. I didn't make this big this, one, this time, sorry about that. But um, the way someone thinks about the world, the way you all think about the world, 
<coughs> a scientific, religious, and cultural worldview. We have all that. You guys are more specific with that, with scientific stuff, worldview. We have a religious worldview. We have a cultural worldview. And the two groups have a very different worldview. And there are two groups who have different worldviews. You have a different worldview from me. But beside each other, Meredith and Tia will have a different worldview as well. Okay. Each and every one of you sitting in this space and here all have a worldview. Those people who are watching it through um, science, technology, Zoom, I don't know what it is, we all have a world view, but in that world view, we hope to create and find commonalities. We tend to too much look at our differences. We all belong to the human race. Okay. Let's focus on our commonalities. Let's focus on the positive stuff. From the Cambridge Dictionary, perspective, perception, sorry, perception, a belief or opinion often held by many people and based on how things seem. Who we perceived creates, sorry, what we perceive creates our world view. Your perception is different to mine. I really like this model. This model here is, as you know, who can explain this? Does anyone know this model? You probably would have been taught this through uni somewhere or high school somewhere. Oops, sorry, Chris, I'll use a little. The iceberg model. You can place any concept in that iceberg model. Okay. We could place Jungan people in this iceberg model. You can place yourself in that ice cube, uh, iceberg ice cube. Iceberg model is bigger than an ice cube. Iceberg model. Because we only see in our world, in the worldview and in our perception, what's above that line. We never see what's underneath. We never see what's underneath for different reasons and different factors and different experiences. So isn't that amazing? You only see that much of people? I only see that much of Tia and American fiction, not even all that. It's probably just right up here in the tip. But there's a whole new stuff underneath here that I don't know about them. It's like us with Jungan people. You can only see up the top. You can never feel, have that connection to land, spirituality to it, having come from it, having born like Uncle Judaloo's father, Poppy, on country, and then being taken away. Because all of that is under here. So I'm gonna have a little bit of fun with you now. It's a little game, it's a little fun. Um, so what we look up on here, and this is to do about our perceptions, all right? The very first thing that pops into your head that you see, right? The very first thing that pops into your head, you can call it out. What do you see? Yeah, call it out. Yeah, let them know in here what, what we're doing. Okay, ready? First one. What do you see? Who saw it? Is that again? Caterpillar. Yay, we all saw a caterpillar. But it's actually. Yeah. How's that? A lovely little group of birds just perched up on a little branch. Okay. Yeah. I just love your reaction. Thank you. <laughs> Next one. Get ready. Get ready. 
I'm not ignoring you <laughs> down the back there, people. I can see you. Sing out down the back what you see. Next one. Ballet dancer. No. So not a ballet dancer. Here is a tulip flower. See the tulip flower? Yeah. And the person is standing behind it. That was our perception of what we saw, but the truth was behind it. Last one. This is going to really blow your mind. <laughs> okay. Right. Crazy, isn't it? It's about how you see it, isn't it? You've got two ways of seeing it. Side and front. That's how we perceive things. But it's still the truth, is it not? Okay. Well, 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 it's being played with. You know, yeah. it's being played with to create that. But that's the truth. That's the truth, yeah. isn't it? We all look at things and we all have our worldview about how we perceive things and what are our truths, what is true to us. And we need to respect that. The Cambridge Dictionary for Perspective means a particular way of considering something. Well, we just did that. Okay. Now I'd like to give you some quotes on perspective. This man here is a geneticist. He's a scientist like you guys in DNA. Could, if, I've got a really thing here. Could somebody, Rod, would you mind reading that out for me, please, Rod? Your perspective is always limited by how much you know. Expand your knowledge and you will transform your mind. Like Dr. Bruce Lipton, is it Lipton? Bruce H. Lipton. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. That's something I would like you to take away with you. Okay. The other one. Uh, James, would you mind reading that for me, please? <laughs> Reality is a question of perspective. I think that's someone rushed you, isn't it? Yes, it is. I can't read the bottom line. Oh, don't worry about the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, it's just this picture quote, but we won't worry about that, okay? <laughs> it's off the WWW site, all right? <laughs> but it's the words. Reality is a question of perspective. Finally. Um, um, Chris, would you mind? Not, oh, nice and loud. I just picked on the guys in the front. Sorry about that. Everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Everything we see is a perspective, not a truth. Marcus Aurelius. Roman? Yes. Fascist. Sorry? <laughs> Somebody said fascist? No, no it's Spanish. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry, I thought you said fattish then. I thought, oh, okay. Wow. He was fattish. Okay. Yeah, too much of the good life. Any questions about those three quotes? Yes, Donna. So many questions, right? Choose one. <laughs> the one that's really singing to you in your heart. How, I guess, how, how do we... You know, there's so much to learn. How do we, how do we best do that? I can't tell you that. I know. <laughs> I can't. No, no, I can't tell you that because that learning belongs to you. Okay. You are the learner for that knowledge, not me. I can give you some perspective on it. Right. But will it be the truth from your end? Yeah. Exactly. And what? How do you sieve through it? What do you do? How do we all sieve through the, the chaos that's around the world today? 
How do we find those truths? How do we find those truths and respect it? Exactly. It's about power. But remember, we vote these people in. All right. We have a say. We have a say in whatever we do and whatever's out there. We have a say to stand up for for us, for our land. You have a say in that to support us if you so wish to. It's your perspective and worldview, and that is up to you. I can't make you. Okay. That will belongs to you, but it's how you use it and what you do. Final quote. If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And it's, it's getting to that. It's how to get to that and how it's not going to rock your worldview. Okay. How it's going to, how that will expand your worldview from Dr. V. Bruce's quote. A lot of us are afraid of expanding because we like to sit safely in a little, in our own little cocooned world. Okay. Don't rock my world. I don't want you to do that. I'm happy where I am. But the world is changing. And we need to sieve through it and we need to have a look at the way it's changing. How would you see it? What can you do to make it to turn it around into a positive place for you, a positive place for all of us to exist in. By looking at our histories, okay. understanding our histories, if you have that knowledge about history, it can take you down those steps. If you don't look at history, then it's not going to get you to where you're sitting and standing now because you need that. We all need our histories. Okay. Lastly, this is this is not lastly. Um, this is a, a man called Leroy Little Bear and I'm sorry I've skipped it here. I rolled up before. But in 2016, notice the date. I just thought, oh, that's a bit of an interesting date when it popped up. Yeah. So he says, oh, how about we forget about your sneezing? You want to read that out to me? Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Then that, that way it'll take you away from your, your sneezing. Well, you focus on something else. Um, and January 26, 2016, any individual within a culture is going to have his or her own personal interpretation of the collective cultural code. However, the individual's worldview has its roots in the culture. That is in the society's shared philosophy, values and customs. If we are to understand how Aboriginal and Eurocentric worldviews clash, we need to understand how the philosophy, values and customs of Aboriginal culture differ from those of Eurocentric cultures. This is Leroy Little Bear Professor. Yeah, he's a professor. He's a professor from, is a Blackfoot? Uh, First Nations um, person in America, uh, researcher, a professor emer uh, emeritus at the University of Leth Lethbridge, founding member of the Canadian of Canada's First Native American Studies Department and recognised leader and advocate for First Nations education rights, self-governance, language and culture. I thought I'd present other perspectives as well, not only ours, but other perspectives as well, so that you get a bit more broader range and idea and thought. Let's have a look now at these. 
worldviews, traditional indigenous worldview versus Western worldviews. Meredith, could you read the first one for me, please? I'm holding it. <laughs> Sorry, I got gotcha. you. Oh, Tia. Oh, Spiritually orientated society. In the Western world? Scientific skeptical requiring proof as a basis for belief. Okay, for those of you who are out there on behind your computers, the first one was spiritually orientated society, system based on belief and spiritual world. For the Western worldview, it's scientific, skeptical, requiring proof as a basis of belief. Indigenous worldviews. The next one, there are many truths. Truths are dependent upon individual experiences. Western worldview, there is only one truth based on science or Western style law. LAW. Indigenous worldview, society operates in a state of relatedness. Everything and everyone is related. There is a real belief that people, objects, and the environment are all connected. Law, kinship, spirituality reinforce this connectedness. Uncle Jude Lou is, is so strong in this. When he goes on country, um, yeah, Stephen, when he goes on country, we will go back on country. I'll just give you a quick little story. I was working in, in, in teaching in, in education, um, and it was it was doing me it was doing my head in, really really doing my head in because I had a we had a climber the same age as me climbing all over your back to get where that person wanted to go. It made me sick. I felt sick. I felt sick here and here, and I said to my husband, I need to go home. I have to go home. So I went home. He said, You're going home. Couldn't afford a flight then on the bus, you know, the Greyhound bus. Sends, sends me home to my mother's country. I go home to my mother's country. I sit on my mother's country. I sit on country. I sit on the dirt. I swim in the river, in the clean water. And it's, it kind of settled, it settled me, it did. Spiritually, because I was back on home, on country. I go back to Brisbane, chaos, the world, and what's going on. As soon as our second son finished high school, I said, I am out of here. I'm going home. So we went home to Cairns because I needed to be home. This was calling me home. Not this, this. Because I had to go back home to find the connectedness to, for myself from country. In the Western worldview, it's compartmentalized society and it's becoming even more so, isn't it? Don't we carpet little boxes? Everything's got to go in there. It's a bit sad, isn't it, that we do that? This is why that quote about change, if you change your, the way you look, things, things that you look at will change. The land is sacred, usually only given by a creator or a supreme being. Worldview, the land is resources, should be available for development and extraction for the benefit of humans. Worldview, indigenous, time, it's not linear, non-linear, cyclic in nature. Time is measured in cyclic events. Cyclic events. The seasons are central to this psychical concept. You've got something happening right now here in Canberra. You've got the changing of the season. Okay. If you ask the traditional owners on this land, on this country, if something out there that is from country that is natural, that's native, that belongs here, that's endemic here, they will tell you, oh, this means this, this means this. 
home and country, if a certain flower comes out, it means that the fish is getting fat. The wattle's coming out, like now, the fish is getting fat, ready to eat. Time is usually linear, linear, linear. let's just say linear, okay? Structured and future orientated. Uh, uh, isn't it future orientated? I have that 24 seven at home. My husband is the epitome of that. Right? Future orientated. In the next five years, we're going to do this. In the next 10 years, we're going to do this. And I'm sort of thinking, uh, where are you now? Aren't you here, right here in the present now? What are you doing now? Okay, we're not there yet. All right. The framework of months, years, days, etc., reinforces that linear structure. Even now, James has got to go somewhere after this. He's on a timeline, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. Example in here. You are all on a timeline. You've come here to give up your little morning tea or whatever to come and, sit and listen to me. All right. Thank you for that. Feeling comfortable is measured by the quality of your relationship with people. Indigenous worldview. Western worldview. Feeling comfortable is, is related to how successful you feel you have been in achieving your goals. Hmm. I hear some, I see some heads shaking here. Though some, some are not I'm too sure, don't know they're thinking, but that's good. Last bit of the information. Worldview, Indigenous, human beings are not the most important in the world. Western concept, worldview, human beings are the most important in the world. Why do we say human beings are not the most important in the world, in non-Indigenous? What's more important to us? I just gave it to you then. The land and being connected to the land. Our connectedness to land is what's important to us. Amassing wealth from the Indigenous world worldview, amassing wealth is important for the good of the community. Western worldview, amassing wealth is for personal gain. Hello, how many billionaires do we have in this world? They amass wealth. Okay, it's personal. If you can get to be that millionaire, billionaire, you've achieved something. I hear someone really thinking hard in there. That's great. Yes, Tom. I do. The Western world view of human beings as the most important in the world comes from the church. It's anthropocentric, human centered. But don't you think that's a little unfair to say that that's still the case? I think people are realising that if they don't put the planet first, then we're heading for disaster. So I think that is changing and it's a changing position. Thank you. Your thinking. <laughs> Your perception is changing. Your thinking. And you're right. And you're correct. We have, we have now got more people in this world being more conscious of what's happening in our world. Not, wouldn't it be wonderful the whole world, but you know, I do take, take your point. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, the lady in the back. Uh, just a counterpoint to that. We only started hearing about the planet and human beings and we're starting to do that. We didn't care about the planet and the human beings. So we're starting to do that. And I can you say can you say can you come up and say it a little bit louder because what you're saying is, is important <laughs> and i'm glad I, you're, i'm involving you people because it's you know it's not me me just blabbing on it's in participation say it again Mark. uh my counterpoint to that was that in, that we only started focusing on, on the environment that human beings were being affected not an ecosystem There you go. And another another perspective. Great. You're thinking. You people are starting to think and view things differently. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Also, there was um, there was a group, and still is a group, of Western worldview that is actually not like that, and has never was never like that, and it was destroyed by you know the right brain fanatical view of the world. Mm -hmm. There is a Western worldview that is left brain, yep. like Steiner and all of those, and it went back and back and back and that was just there was a you know there was a you know before plato and things yes, like that yeah. there was a different view yes yeah. yeah yeah no thank you thank you for saying that look um what you're what you're all saying um are truths isn't it okay you've just spoken about your perception and worldview okay. you've given it and it's being respected by each and every one of us in this room. It's something that we need to go away and think about. Your comment, your comment, sir, your comment, done. All valid, all valid. It's how we want to take that information and use it, how you want to take that information and use it. It's not about what I do, Uncle Judy and Stephen. It's about how you take it away and use it because they're all valid comments. I suppose the only question is how would all this feed into the voice department? We are the mass, aren't we? we are, are we the mass? Like I said, didn't we put them in there? We can take them out. <laughs> we have a voice. Thank you for doing that, people. That was greatly appreciated. Thank you for sharing that. Let me just get this going, Chris. It's not. Let me move that little dot. Okay, well, we're done. All right. Sorry about that, people. Okay, the importance of being on country. Aboriginal culture is holistic, defined by its connection uh, connection to family, community, and country. In Australia, the idea of being on country is central to Aboriginal worldview. The land or country is what defines Aboriginal people. Aboriginal people from the coast describe themselves as saltwater people, those from the rivers, freshwater people, those from central and arid regions, desert people, those from country where we are, savannah. But remember, what terms are these? They ain't my terms. These are? non-indigenous western worldview yeah. terms and terminology isn't it because then that puts you in the picture doesn't it you can see that you can see a dry arid place you can see fresh water you can see salt water those words aren't our words it's just there to illustrate a concept country is not just a beautiful place to us it is everything, says Juan Walker. He is a Kuku Yalanji man, is that correct, Uncle Doodaloo? Yeah, yeah Kuku yeah, Yalanji man. It holds our stories, our religion, our customs, and our ancestors. This is because Aboriginal people believe their ancestral spirits emerged from the earth and the sky. These ancestral beings are hero ancestors, creators, and it's through their journey that Aboriginal people believe all living things are created. These creation forces are constantly present, hence the strong cultural connection between Aboriginal people, the land and place. This is what Juan said. The land, Aboriginal strand perspectives. So Captain Cook claimed possession of Australia for the British under the European legal system of, what's the word everyone? Terminalist. Thank you. This meant land belonging to no one and it denied the Indigenous peoples the right to negotiate treaties and to claim ownership of the land. 
The indigenous peoples did not farm or fence the land like the Europeans. And many of the dwellings and shelters were not permanent, like the ones built by the Euro Europeans. Remember, I'm talking about the concept that came here back in the British concept, imperialistic worldview. Although I must say it still continues today in some people's worldview. When the British arrived, they decided that Australia's land was not being used, did not belong to the Indigenous people. The arrival of the first fleet into Sydney Cove was the start of the battle for the land of Australia. British became familiar with an Aboriginal man called Benelong. In the early years of the colony, Benelong declared that Goat Island was his family home. You can understand that concept, can't you? Family home. This surprised the British settlers. They thought that the indigenous peoples were nomadic and had no fixed address. If I've put in there, if you read and have a look at, I oh know I forgot to bring it. It's about that thick, and it's only a little bit of book, by Bruce Pascoe called Dark Emu. Has anyone read that? Oh, yes. Great. Um, you have your own worldviews about it, perspectives about, about it. I'm not going to question you about it, but have a look at it, read it. It's not going to take you long to get through it, okay? But it, it's, a, it's a good source of information. It really does change what I think, um, even, even for myself, because when I went to school, Aboriginal studies was not put on there. You know, we were taught the British system of how Australia was Australia. Okay. So that's Bruce Pascoe. The other one too is Blood on the on the Wattle and also um, The Final Frontier by Henry Reynolds. For us, the Indigenous Australian people, Indigenous Australian people, we have a very close relationship with the land. It is our spiritual home. Our culture and spirituality is inseparable, inseparable from the land. Every part of our lives have a connection to it. If you ever have a chance to get up to North Queensland, if you ever have a chance to get to Cairns, oh, I see someone nodding, you've been there? Oh, yes, okay. Um, there's something about it, isn't there? Oh, yes, there's something about it. Um, if you come on country, if you come and see us and come to our office, um, if you'd like to go into country, I'm sure we could fix something up for you to go out on country, to let you know you can go out in country. And on my mother's country too, the fresh water's out there. It's just stunning, amazing. You'll never want to leave. That's the truth. Sorry, Chris, I'm just having a little bit of thing here with this. It's not, it's not coming down to me, no? I'm sorry, I've gone to 12 o'clock. Um, sorry, Chris, I just can't move this this little thing here, no? Yes, please. Oh, that's why, because it's time. Yes. Nearly finished, people. There you go. Okay, okay, this one, yeah, okay. So, land is, uh, land to us is not private land. It cannot be bought or sold. It is not owned by any person, but rather the land and the things on it needs to be looked after and cared for by us, the people, the clan. The survival of us as Indigenous Australian people depend on knowing the land and knowing which resources were available at certain times and in certain locations. If necessary, the groups moved between camps to gather and collect food and to check if country needed to be cared for, or looked after or restored. Okay. Indigenous Australians, us, 
um, groups lived in territories that were boundaries between the lands of different groups. If you go in and if you'd like to research this, and I forgot to put it on, on the slide, um, is Tinsdale's Map of Languages. And you will see, I'm seeing a lovely lady here shaking her head. So she's actually seen it and knows what I'm talking about. If you haven't, have a little look, look at it. We're not recorded on paper, but we're clearly understood by all groups and were held in the memories of the elders, rivers, mountain ranges and other land formations provided borders that were understood by everybody in the clan. Some territories could be shared between different clans, but to enter the homeland of another group required negotiation and ceremony. It is also meant that the visiting groups had to return the deed and allow access to their land. Indigenous peoples were also know, knew what was happening in distant lands through trade relations and through dreaming stories and songs that were learnt from other groups. So you weren't stuck in your own little group as people thought before. No, there was communication. Okay, there was connectedness with other <coughs> groups and surrounding groups around you. There's a story, I think, Uncle Julia, that connects South Australia, Seven Sisters, that go all the way up to North, far North Queensland, to the Seven Sisters up there at Yungaburra. I was told this by um, an Aboriginal person. European perspectives. The European perspectives of land owning was entirely different to Aboriginal perspective. That's Indigenous Australia. It was competitive and individualistic. Owning land meant power. Owning land meant you had all the resources that you could use. Land could be bought or taken by force. Farmed, mined or sold. Land could be exploited and used. Land was cleared and fenced. Access denied to Aboriginal people to go back on their land, to go back on their country, to check to see if those sacred sites needed to be looked after, if anything was desecrated or taken. They, had, they were denied access back to it. They were denied their food, food source, their water source as well, and their, and their dreaming and stories and storylines that was associated and had connectedness to that land. Land was to be conquered. Land needed to be discovered and civilised. Many Aboriginal lives were lost at the British, as, the, um, as the British settled across this great land, Australia. You have three people in this room that could tell you stories about that. Very strong, very emotional, very heart-rendering, heartbreaking stories about what happened in our past, in our history. I can remember my great grandfather. I saw him with his initiation scars on his chest and on his back. I was 16 at the time when he passed away. And for a man to take a wife, you had to be have gone through all that initiation process, which would have been 30 plus years before you were allowed to take a wife. So knowing knowing that all of that was broken, all of that was taken, all of that was decimated and destroyed because land needed to be discovered and civilised. What does it mean to us? Here's one, here's a lady here. I'm sorry, the um, Kaliku woman, she is, uh, she, her name is Amberlyn uh, Kawai uh, Molina and she is an Aboriginal law academic who comes from uh, Pelikoo people of the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Her work includes transforming teaching and research spaces to be respected and inclusive of Indigenous peoples. This is what she's got to say. Could somebody read that for me, please? You, sir? Either one. Either or. Nice loud voice. You have a loud voice. For Aboriginal people, country is much more than a place. Rock, tree, river, hill, animal, human, 
all the form of the same substance. By the ancestors who continued to live in the land, water, sky. The country is built with the relations speaking the language and following law. No matter whether the shape of the relation is human, rock, crow, water. The country is loved, needed, and cared for. And the country loves, needs, and cares for the people in turn. The country, its family, culture, identity. The country is self. Country is self. I teach, or well, I taught in TAFE uh, for a number of years. And I taught um, cultural identity to our uh, Cert 3, Cert 4s and diploma students, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander students who were getting um, their certificates in education, um, which allowed them to go on further. I also taught to the wider community. If you don't have country, you don't have self. You don't have an identity. You don't have your language, you don't have your stories, you don't have your songs, you don't have your dance. Because where are you going to perform them, speak of them, know them, if not on country? A lot of our people were taken off country and put into missions to protect us, keep us safe. But that was probably on another man's country. That wasn't our country. And it happened to us. So who are we? And where are we? I know, I'm sorry. I know, Robert, he's looking at the time and he's going, no. All right. So we are, are located approximately 100 kilometres west of Cairns in, the far, in far north Queensland. It is also known as... Mount Mulligan. It's a vi visually strikingly huge tabletop mountain around 10 times the size of Uluru that rears out of the North Queensland, Northern Queensland landscape. The tabletop mountain runs for more than 18 kilometres and 1.6 kilometres wide. The tabletop mountain is a monolith bound by high cliffs or escarpments that fall 200 to, to, four, 200 to 400 metres to the surrounding Hodgkinson Basin, making it an impressive natural monument. The mountain is sacred to us, to us Jungan people. Excavation of the rock shelters on Nullarbulgan show that Aboriginal people first began living on the mountains more than 37,000 years ago. On the tabletop itself, I found the two oldest known Aboriginal sites in Queensland, Nunda Rock and Nullarbulgan Cave. Here, Aboriginal culture deposits have been uh, radiocarbon dated and dated by OSL. I'm not going to say that word. Back to 40,000 years plus. And this came from Professor Bruno David who next week we're going to go and see at Monash University. He has done extensive work up on Nullarbulgan. And Uncle Jude Lou's father, Poppy Neal, there's a video of him with um, uh, Bruno David on Quantum ABC. Another ancient rock shelter, uh, site on the mountain has been dated to the to the end of the last ice age and to, this is information for you scientists I'm not really saying anything here I think you probably will know some stuff archaeological caves and rock shelters found in and around Nullarbulgan constitutes Queensland's greatest density of known date uh, dates sites dating back to more than uh, 4,000 years BP well it's probably more more than that the combination of, of impressive natural forces, natural force uh, features, Aboriginal beliefs and uh, mythologies and archaeological sites of such antiquity make Nullarbulgan the oldest known and dated cultural landscape in Queensland. And the place of, of state, national and international interest and scientific significance. Why? 
I'll show you why in a minute. Geomorphology. So this should interest you scientists. The mountain was originally formed in a narrow uh, faulted rift running in a general southwest to northwest direction within the deformed and folded metamorphic rock, Arnite, am I right, of the Hodgkinson Basin. Successive layers of sediment were deposited into this rift, filling its first with Permian coal at its base, then Permian deposits eroded away, leaving Nullarbogan as a freestanding conglomerate and sandstone massif. Yes? Thank you, scientists. This is what really, really gets me. Flora and fauna. The vegetation on Nullarbogan tabletop has been described as wet tropic, sclerophyll forest, mainly of bloodwood, which is a really, really strong hardwood. Species of eucalyptus with a well-developed understory. Understory, as you know, what understory is. Yep. Yeah. This this tabletop forest contrasts noticeably with the open sclerophyll uh, woodland. So on top, it's got a really dense understory. Around it, around the mountain, it's very open woodland. Studies of both Nullarbogan eucalypt forest and its surrounding woodlands identified 13 distinct land units supporting flora, 10, spe uh, 10 plant species that are considered either rare or threatened, <coughs> including and including plant species that are found nowhere else. And when we say nowhere else, we mean nowhere else in Australia and nowhere else in the world. It is endemic, it is specific to that mountain. Fauna, eight frog species, 55 reptile species, 99 bird species, and 20 mammal species, 22 of which are species of special conservation significance under either the Queensland or Australian biodiversity conservation statutory, um, statutory regimes. So this mountain is pretty significant. Just to, just to take it back a little bit, I'm very quickly going to go to this. At the time when I was talking about, we talked about um, land was uh, needed to be civilised. So Aboriginal people actually lived at the time under three laws. You have Aboriginal law, you have the British law, and then you have policies and acts that were created by the, the Australian states to control Aboriginal and Indigenous people, Aboriginal people. These policies and acts were created and put into place to take Aboriginal people away from land, away from country, to destroy the fabric of Aboriginal people's existence and to utilise the land for their own benefit, either legally or illegally. Jungan people were forcibly removed from country to keep them safe, like I said before, and were sent away to other people's lands to live. And these, these, places, and, uh, these places were created for us and they were at the time called missions. So you would have Mona Mona mission, you would have Yarrabo mission, you would have Palm Island mission. Okay. So they took us off the land to keep us safe. But in the meantime, it was twofold. That land was taken and then used. Okay. Not for our benefit, because we were kept safe in a way. If you come up home, you go to Cairns, Yarraba, it's out of sight. Out of mind, out of sight. You can't see it, but it's there. And I tell you what, nowadays the developers are really, really looking at that particular piece of land because it's stunning. This are some lovely photos of country. So this is not a book. It stands alone. I'll use it, Chris. No, I won't use it, Chris. Uh, can I use it? There it is there, the green part. That's how big it is. These are photos of it. Look how long it is. Look how look how long it is. Look. It's massive. It's a massive mountain. It's beautiful. Here it is again. Here it is again. 
there it is again. I am very honoured, very privileged to be part of this clan, this country, to be a Kukajungan woman, to go out there and visit that land. When I first saw this, I'd never seen it until last year. My sister had, my younger sister had already gone out there. I'd never seen it. I heard so much about it. When I saw it, a goosebumps just poured all over me. Because to see it in reality, just it's a tangible thing. To see it, to see have its presence was just spiritually mind boggling. You can go and visit there if you want to. There's a beautiful resort there. If you've got $2,000 to pay per night. <laughs> OK, stunning place. You can go and see it, you can go and visit it. But you won't get much out of it if you're not with us. To take you there, to show you. Is that right, Meredith? Yes. To you. you have to go up there. Don't go to Chris Morris's place. <laughs> Last one. Look, you know, we're talking about natural resources. So what happened here? In the 1870s, the gold rush came, you know, land. This is the natural resources that was on Australia. Um, led to sustained uh, sustained contact between Aboriginal people and the outside world. 35,000 European and Chinese people merged onto country, onto Jungan country. Then in 1907, coal was discovered at Nullarbogan. And by 1921, Mount Mulligan, Nullarbogan's township, had 300 residents. In, nine, in 19, the 19th of September, 2021, a massive explosion happened and it killed everyone that was in the tunnel under in the mountain, going into the mountain. You can actually see it, it's there. 75 people died and today it ranks as Queensland's most worst mining disaster in history. For us, that was, that was a warning to them that was where the spirit of the country, the spirit of Nullarbogan was saying to you, don't touch that. Leave it where it is. And the consequences was loss. Okay, finally, this is the last part. I'm, I'm so sorry. Geoscience Australia working together with us. Well, the process has already started. Jungle people have developed a healthy country plan, future involvement with future involvement with geoscience. Within this plan, we identified eight values that we need that we need to care for and manage. And this is where we hope geoscience will be part of. Nullarbogan itself is one of the values, jungle people, spirit and country, cultural heritage sites, bana, which means water, Wunchu, uh, which means fire, plants and animals, we can, good governance, enterprise and livelihood. I think those of you who work in geoscience in, in a specific area will probably will have your little toe in with us in that. In all our values listed, we see geoscience becoming more involved in assisting us. We also see geoscience becoming involved in our projects that we are developing. Now, I know through your projects and your values that you have or your topics that you have, um, one of the concerns, and I think this is why the, the contact between geoscience and us happened because of the concerns that we had um, because when geoscience came to us, they were going to put a hole and put some device in this hole and putting it everywhere to measure. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. That became a concern. Ooh. Because then that information that was collected, that data that was collected was then put up for 
public use. The danger to us, or what it was for me, and from my perspective, was that unscrupulous miners would come along and do things to it. So that was the concern from my perspective. So this is what I didn't want to see. Of course, you'll know that last picture is fracking, coal seam gas. James, could you read that one for me, please? Both provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not every man's greed. Okay. We are, we are absolutely, absolutely tearing away, taking, taking, taking and taking, and what are we giving back? Just a thought to think on. What we want and would like to see is a more sustainable approach to how we view and use and look after land. We all have a responsibility to care for this earth. Why? Because it's the only home we have. Here's some quotes. Could I get someone to read that for me? I'm getting a little bit emotional about this. Would, would somebody like to read that? Nice loud voice. We're on earth to take care of life. We're on earth to take care of each other. What do you know, John Denver? Chris? Oh, he needs his thing, sorry. The future of life on Earth depends on our ability to see the sacred where others see only the common. Can you see that and hear that, everyone in the back? John Denver says, the future of life on Earth depends on our ability to see the sacred where others see only the common. Last one, Mahatma Gandhi. The future depends on what we do in the present. I'd like to thank you, audience and geoscience, for participating with me on this presentation. I hope you have gained something from this, and I hope it's got your thinking about what I've presented to you. So from the Jungan people of Nullarbulgan, thank you for having us. <laughs>